Barbara <clears throat> in her interesting way of proceeding asked me to say a few words about what we were doing in Arizona, writing. Well, Here. <clears throat> well, one of the things I wanted to do is to complete this dialogue the challenge of Plato's Parmenides to know thyself by way of the dialectic. It ran a hundred and some pages and I finished it. Now, what is it? It's like three years of work and I decided to sit down and see whether we could just summarize it in a fun dialogue. So that's what, that's what happened. Okay. Now, this idea They're in opposition. And for some years now, I have been exploring philosophical midwifery. Developed a book, talks, lectures. And this comes down to understanding the origin of this ignorance of the self with the idea of the pathologos. And while I have been doing that, I also uh, thought it might be worthwhile in the past couple of years of writing a couple of things that I've been reflecting on over the years. And so, uh, put together uh, 11 dialogues. And uh, through the noble efforts of Nancy, she went through them this time, cleaned them up, and that's what she was doing. And then I decided it would also be good to do a work on analogy and truth. And that turned out to be, stay there. Another one, and this one equally is completed, the philosophy of the Logos and analogy. And uh, 
This is, of course, uh, then I thought it'd be good to uh, Another dialogue called Analogy, Dreams, and the Logos. Well, um, things happened. I had a little extra time, so uh, And so I did another one on a fourth dimension that we covered on a Friday night. So these have been lingering on the back background, and I've like I've. Before this, I maybe finish 90% of it or something like that and put them on the shelf. So pull them out again and finish them, which really means uh, Nancy saying, Pierre, finish them. <laughs> so now, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> One last thing. Socrates and Jesus. Dialogue taking place in the heavens. The last parts of that are all done. And this one is getting close now to being published is being put together in the final. So, one, right, uh, two, three, four, five. And in the five are a couple of dialogues which are relatively new because I didn't have anything else to do so I knocked out one or two So, um, what does it mean? What does it mean to do all this? You see, it all started with what they call the Arm Sutra, and all of these are really implications of the Arm Sutra, <laughs> Philosophica Midwifery. And I wanted to get a chance to spell it out. Now, there's another work that's in the background that I haven't done. And uh, uh, that needs to be done. Uh, I'm getting a copy of it from Brian and Regina that have been going over it. And they're going to finally give it up, and I'm going to take it and go back to Arizona and finish the darn thing. But, hey, all of this, all of this stuff comes out of just one thinker. Xenophanes. It all comes out of him. Right. What is it that sees and hears and thinks? 
And that gentleman was the teacher of Parmenides, and on from that point on it went. So I think uh, this work um, I should call this, by the way, uh, The Philosopher's Journey. That's Parmenides. So, um, looks like we're going to clutter up the world with a couple of volumes. And they should be ready to go down the tubes and be published. Sure. But uh, what does it mean? Now, that's an Athenese. Only he says it's the whole, it's the whole that sees and hears and thinks. And other commentaries say what he really means is mind. But all of these works are trying to get back to the primary issue of this question. Now, to stay, to stay with this question, that's all, is a yoga. This is a fundamental yoga of all yogas. Because if you get, if you then understand what it is that sees, hears, and thinks, everything changes. Everything changes. And on the other hand, Nothing changes. So what I tried to do is to take this issue and build a whole dialogue in terms of the study of Plato's Parmenides. So then this spurred Parmenides into doing what he did. And he comes up with the most astonishing insight, and that is the fundamental, the fundamental, if you see this, there's only one thing you come to, that the fundamental vision of the nature of our condition is that what, you, what is it that you understand? You understand that, That's the highest vision, one self. That's Parmenides' own hypothesis. And when we unfold it, it's this. This is, this is so fundamental. Um, it's so obvious 
that it really should become part of our education. Right? High school. Just, there it is, kids. What do you think? Let them write articles. Let them paint it. Let them put it to music or dance or write about it. So therefore, to, to try to help make this clear, I finish this dialogue on the philosopher. And uh, the challenge of Plato's Parmenides to know thyself by way of the dialectic. And it even has some diagrams. So, um, what else should I say, Barbara, since you started this? Well, I just thought you might have some ideas percolating around that we can see um, that you might want to unfold um, or um, take us through or play with. Well, I have a suggestion. Yeah. All right. Say, so, Brian, um, are you good at counting? Yeah, yeah. Have you gone beyond 100? Beyond 100. <laughs> have you gone as far as 104? Give me a number between 1 and 104. Uh, 67. 67. You said 67? No, he shouldn't have done that. <laughs> Which page did you say? 67. Wow. That's a number I thought of. Ooh, here. OK. Nancy, hmm. who had been silent, said, uh, uh, before I say what I want to say, I offer this in a spirit of fairness. I'm a philosophical midwife. I've had many talks and dream reviews. I haven't spoken up now because I thought someone else would voice my concerns. So, no one has. And that leaves me to say some things that some of you might find offensive. But since I have heard the word truth enough, it means I have to share my own thoughts and about truth. Here's the issue. You think the self in each of us is some kind of exalted thing. You say it has the power to cut through fictions and to see into oneself and others. Sounds good without being true because it isn't true. The truth is that it goes around with us and can easily, we can be easily be fooled about the self as well as fooled by others. First off, I'll accept that I've seen enough in our philosophical midwifery to say it is true that it only works on small problems, practical problems, once in a while theoretical problems. However, everyone lives with fictions that can't be seen through. Or if it is seen, it doesn't make any difference. Why? 
because I've known many of the so-called wise men and women. Each has had their Achilles heel. Some fiction that dogs them through to their own death. I could cite priests, roshis, yogis, rabbis, and we both know that none of them is free from their most basic problems. Why? It's because the self shows its weakness whenever it seeks to achieve some perfect state. Simply the mind has its own natural limitations. It can solve, it can solve practical and some philosophical issues, but it can't solve the roots of our own fundamental ignorance. Perhaps the only thing we can say is that the self is fooled all the time. It accepts the false as true and lets us play out our tragedies and our suffering with an inability to make the most real, meaningful changes. No one can avoid our fundamental problems. No one can avoid our fundamental catastrophes. Mankind is a doomed species. The power of ignorance really pours over all else. And it really has a more powerful presence than what you call reality or true being. Now, I'm not giving an argument. I'm merely describing the human condition and predicament. If there was a rational argument, describing or trying to describe this human predicament, then there might be a way to explain and get out of it, but there isn't any. I believe problems are inherently, incontrovertibly irrational and show the irrational nature of the self. That's Nancy's position. He picked it out. Now the response, from your statement, it appears you are not at all reluctant to exploring whether or not the self and its problems can be sufficiently understood to answer your other points. As a departure point, would you agree when someone is under the influence of false beliefs about themselves? about their actions that follow from false beliefs, that they are indeed all irrational? Nancy, yeah, sure thing. I've seen this in so many talks and philosophical reviews. Uh, would you go further and say that under those very conditions, that they are out of touch with their own reality? Again, would you also say that for such people, the reality they ignore is for them what does not exist? Nancy. That's right. For them, there's no other reality than what they experience through their belief systems. Would you agree that reality taken as a whole is a oneness? and can be referred to as the one that is? Nancy, sure. <laughs> I said, let me add another thing. If such people accept the idea of the self and ignore or deny the one that is, would that be their position? Nancy. Um, um, she pauses. Well, strictly speaking, speaking, it doesn't play any role in their way of being since all they encounter are the consequences of believing what is false about themselves. Say, in a strict way, would you say that the one they deny or ignore completely is the one that is not 
that they had, that, pardon me, in a strict way, would you say that the one they ignore or deny completely is the one that is not, and that they impute existence to it, since that's what they say it is? Uh, Nancy, that's a tough one for me. Uh, can you offer some example? Um, well, if there really are false beliefs that people have of themselves, would you not say that it has a mode of existence or being, since it functions as a fiction? Nancy, yeah, yeah. yeah so when the one that is is denied and called the one that is not, you're really focusing on the verb is and saying it must have some mode of being to be not so that that which is not exists. That is to say, fictions exist, don't they? Yeah, yeah, yes to that. And existing, we can say they share in some aspect of being. Nancy reflects, what? Is there a reason for that? I can follow the logic without seeing the reason for it. Well, you have a good question. So let me ask you, if we have already granted to the one which is not an existence and a mode of being, so then the difference between that one which is not and non-being lies in the, lies in the presence or absence of being or existence. And she said, listening to that issue depends upon how you understand being, doesn't it? So this is a dialogue that you can attribute to Nancy. Oh, okay. And I might say she has a couple of words to say about it when we get into the heavier part. What was it? There's a very tough dialogue that Nancy goes through. Um, in this work, the sixth hypothesis is the pathologos. So you can say the second hypothesis is to the logos as the sixth is to the pathologos. David jumps in at this point. I like what you've said about the, the bond. I haven't seen it that way. It was very helpful. We talked about the bond. I skipped that. Um, this another party comes in by the name of uh, Regina. Oh, that's right. So the six hypothesis reflects or can be the model for the pathologos, while itself is false and is believed real and has a way of existing. So long as the pathologos endures, it clouds over the true self. It's a logical system without meaning and cannot in principle be called true. Thanks for that, I appreciate it. Jeff comes in at this point and says, I'd like a summary of it and you can create a model for it which goes on and on and on. So that's what happened in Arizona. <laughs> I skipped the dialogue that, that uh, should I go through today? Go ahead. Want to come up and read it? This is a, this is a, this is a,
that you're about done. How about your computer? Doesn't it have these dialogues on there? What do you mean when you say done? I, I didn't say on there. I said about them. You can play Nancy, I'll play I. Oh, okay. okay. <clears throat> you have a good question. So let me ask you, if we have already granted to the one, which is not existence and a mode of being. If so, then the difference between that one which is not and non-being lies in the presence or absence of existence or being. He has to be part of it. I'll take him. He wants to get in the act. Yeah, he likes to be up where the conversation is. Oh, let's see. Interesting that the issue depends on how we understand being, doesn't it? Yes, indeed, because the idea of being here must be the bond of non-being in order for it to be that which is not. And the same goes for the self, doesn't it? I think you're in the sixth hypothesis, and that one I found somewhat difficult to penetrate. Can you explain that point, please? For a being to be perfectly what it is, it must have a bond to be what it is not. Do it again. For a being to be perfectly what it is, it must have a bond to not be what it is not. Or for it to be what it is, it must not be other than itself, what it is, which it is not. And must we not agree and say that the same thing must be true about the self? I follow what you're saying without grasping, as I would wish, the idea of the bond. If it applies to the self, you are saying that the self must possess the bond of non-being too. Am I right about that? Yes. It is a curious idea that we mentioned before, but it's worth repeating. Let me ask you if you agree that for something to maintain the way it's being or existing that is different from itself and being itself. Right? Let me ask you if you agree that for something to maintain its way of being or existing that is different from itself and being itself. For if you agree, then that difference must be able to preserve it from changing into that which it is not. If so, then it needs something to protect itself and to maintain its function, its place, and its interior boundary. So the bond that, that the self and the one that is not needs non-being to be that which it is not and that keeps it perfectly from being other than what it is. And since it needs something different from itself, we can say that its opposite will function to keep it from being other than itself. Frankly and curiously, I'm following the logic of it all. The idea of bond must extend to the idea of the pathologos. It sure is a system of thought that is consistent and has its own logic, so it must appear as rational to the believer. Would you say that its appearance of being rational is actually a bond of rationality that keeps it contained within itself? Nice idea you have. On the other level, on another level, you can say that it is part of the nature of our reality. That since being participates in Hosea, in order to share in the rational, and on the other hand, it participates in non usia so that it may be non-being, if it is to be perfectly what it is. The non usia allows a non-rational way of functioning as the usia allows a most rational way of being. Now that is good. I would like to add that one of them explains the necessity for the pathologos as the Logos explains the necessity for the purely rational. Yes, indeed, you are correct in that. You can also say that the second hypothesis 
is to the logos as the sixth is to the pathologos. And then in comes David. Thank you. So, <laughs> so that, that's what we did in Arizona. Good show. Nice. What question do you have, Brian? Are you still good at numbering? Yeah. Oh, good. Um, can you give me a number from 1 to 67? I wanted to go the other way. Huh? I wanted to go the other way. You want to pass the buck? Yeah, I'll pass it. Uh, wait a minute. Can you count up to 67? Oh. 39. 38? 39. 39. 38. 38. Oh. This is a, a model of the fourth dimension, so let me skip that. Take another number. Because <laughs> I did just okay. to read it. Between one and six. Twenty one? No, between one and sixty seven? Yeah. <clears throat> Twenty two. Twenty three? Twenty two. Twenty three. <laughs> 22. Okay. Want to read it, Brian? <laughs> yeah, see? <laughs> St. Bernard, I'm telling you, we got to watch him. You'll be Joseph. Okay. Uh, am I starting here? Uh, start. or here. Okay. You are asking who or what possesses the highest art. Interesting question you have here, Joseph. From our reasoning, you have to have bestow a unique. You have to bestow. Yeah. Have to have bestowed. Do it again. From, okay. You are asking who or what possesses the highest art. Interesting question you have here, Joseph. From our reasoning, it would have to have bestowed a unique benefit. It would have to meet a purely unmet and even an unsuspected mm -hmm. need. It would require an exquisite knowledge as profound as could be and offered with the mark of integrity. Wonderful. That is a good estimate. Brian, good point. I would add to it something that I think is uniquely different from all the other arts, since each bestows a particular benefit to a particular class of subjects. Could there be an art with a vastly superior art that benefits all classes? Could there, so let me do it again. 
Could there be an art with a vastly superior art that benefits all classes? It comes to us in such a way that if we puzzle it out, it will bring us to see what is obvious but hidden from our sight. In coming to understand it, we discover a new way of seeing that reaches fur furthest to awaken insight into the divine. Now, Joseph, would you mind explaining what you were talking about? What we just did was to define the platonic idea of providence. For it is a wisdom that comes to us in dreams that carries with it all that we say. We say that creator is the dream the, we say that the creator is the dream master, but his art is the art providential is the providential art of divination. So one more time. We say that the creator is the dream master, but his art is the providential art of divination. Really, when one discovers the meaning of one's dreams, it is that meaning that is a particular manifestation of the Logos. For it opens the presence mysteries, draws forth from draws forth from the past a learning that created the problem and our misery. It creates through its purifying function a glimpse of our destiny. Within its scope, there are purely prophetic dreams that announce our tasks and provide the gifts for its realization. Our philosophical midwifery is a mirror image of this art of providence. So, the highest term you are going to say will be the cause of all the lesser terms. And the way the highest term functions, we can say all those subordinate to it including the dream work, daydream work, and mm -hmm. problem solving and philosophical midwifery are minor images mirror. of mirror, I'm sorry, mirror images of the highest term. Now, that has an amazing scope to it. Yes. And notice that it continually causes us to spin around and reflect on the mystery of our existence. The highest term does not admit of any relative status. So we can call it a primary idea. In this way, can we not say that for every primary idea, there is its opposite? If so, would you say that the natural ratio of primary ideas have an opposite and can be contrasted with their opposite? And can we add that they should be contrasted with their opposites if we are to understand each of the primary ideas? For do we not learn much about justice by reflecting and contrasting it with its opposite, injustice? Just so then, the opposite of providence is the transmission of ignorance that we call pathologos police. Very nice study of the primary idea and well worked out. I must admit that I found it a distinct and strange kind of delight in reviewing it with you. Yes. The use of analogies can bring insights into problems, creates the need for new ideas, recasts ideas into a more significant structure of ideas, and it does highlight the primary ideas of their class or set. Sure thing, and it is strange to call them arts, but what's in a name? Yes, it is only a name, but the name art does signify something important an ethic that brings with it an excellence and that ensures the integrity of the art. What's that? I noticed you used the idea of set. I hadn't paid attention to that before. But are you linking all this to set theory? How can analogy be in the same class as set theory? Set theory's terms are, homoge homo set theory's terms are homogeneous. They are quantitative terms. Or, since they are symbols for things, they can be represented as if they were alike. And so they can rep be represented by homogeneous terms. When analogies function with homogeneous terms, like numbers or lines, they are called proportions. But in addition, analog analogies can employ heterogeneous terms or ideas. 
For ideas are not alike one another, like the homogeneous terms. So analogy can subsume set theory. What is added that set theory lacks? Can set theory explain why the highest term in a hierarchical set is the source of the lesser terms? Say, I only had an intro on this set theory. You're asking the wrong person. However, I do know that when sets have matching terms, they can be said to be equal. You are making a different point, aren't you? Yes. When terms are in equal sets, there is no requirement that they should be arranged hierarchically. But in analogy, it is necessary. Let me state the consequences simply and say that when analogies are arranged hierarchically, they have the power to represent philosophical systems as rich as the platonic. They can express its principles and functions in terms of a system of simple interlocking analogies. The consequence of such a system is that it could bring inquiring minds to see and understand that the cosmos is a rational, metaphysical, coherent system, that it is understandable and capable of being verified in one's experience. It would be a purely rational, deductive system. And we sure need that, don't we? Yes, it would seem to be a purely rational structure, except that a few of its principal propositions presuppose a knowledge into the very nature of reality, so that it is not a purely rational system. A purely rational system mirrors, as it were, the logos. Those reflecting upon such a system create the conditions for more profound experiences than they would if they studied and sought to master a purely rational system. Are you saying that it has been done? Where? It already exists in Proclus' Platonic Theology and in his Elements of Theology. Why don't you add them to your paper and present it at the festival? <laughs> sure enough. <laughs> yeah? He's, he's the spokesman, Brian, is the spokesman. Nice. It's only fair that he read it. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what we did. Nice. When do they come out in print? When can we buy them? Well, as soon as they Good. wrap it up. The first one is already in, in the works, which is uh, Socrates and Jesus which is a fun one. And so those are the, this is it. So let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, six. Now we both realize that the readership is gonna be rather limited. But it's been a hell of a lot of fun doing it. <laughs> the world certainly needs readings like this. Yes. It certainly needs them, especially now with all the politics going on. Got to keep on okay. Looking forward to reading them all. Okay. Barbara, you have an announcement for tomorrow? Yeah, actually, yeah, one for tomorrow and one for tonight. Tomorrow, David couldn't be here tonight, but he asked me to let everyone know he's opening his place um, for dialogue with Pierre. Pierre has agreed to come. So the usual 10 o'clock at, at David's house. The second announcement is, if you have any donations, I would take them. We do need to pay the rent, and we only don't have very many expenses, but thank you. Okay. Thank you, guys.
Mm. Could be. Mm. Mm. How's your world? Where are you riding? Where? Uh, I've been riding, you know, locally. I haven't really. Okay. I, I, I plan on going to San Diego, but I haven't done it yet. Mm. I'll, I'll probably ride over there tomorrow. How much have, have you gotten into Lisp? Lisp? Not very much. Why not? Um, is, it, is it a goal? It's not really used in. Uh, in of course not. Kind of a, but it, there's a way of understanding. Ivory, ivory Tower thing. What? It's it's not really